What's up internet, my name is Michael Cook, this is Blue Giant Media, and we're here to connect through gaming. Today we're going to put the spotlight on A Game of Thrones Catan by Klaus and Benjamin Tuber, published by Fantasy Flight Games. We're going to go ahead and take a quick rules overview so you can get a feel for how the game plays and how it differs from Catan, and then we're going to come back and I'm going to let you know what I do like, what I don't like, and who I think may or may not like Game of Thrones Catan. <laughs> All right, so here I have Game of Thrones, Catan, Brotherhood of the Watch set up for three players. And I wanna go over, while the game can be played, um, the, the normal vanilla way of playing Catan, we're gonna talk about what's different. Some of the things that are different right away. You see this big old wall here. And at the start of the game, there's going to be one of each of these dudes along the wall. So as the game goes on, there's gonna be various times where these different tokens are going to get flipped over. And they're going to show a type of wildling that is going to come up and a track that they are going to come on to. So here you see all three different possible symbols, which we have a regular, a climber, and an ice giant, and the three different possible paths corresponding to the three paths up here. So when one of these is turned over, this would show that an ice giant is going to come out on the path with the foot. And when they come out, they come out on the biggest fire, which means the first one comes out all the way at the front. And why that matters is because you're now going to be rolling three dice. You'll roll the two six-sided dice, which are still going to do the same type of thing. That would make the settlements that border the uh, spaces with a six would get resources. So the red player would get a wood. The yellow player is going to get a uh, sheep. But then the 12 sided die is going to trigger advances on the different rows. So right here a 6, 7, or 8 will bring this frost giant into either here for a 6 or here for either a 7 or 8. 9, 10, 11, 12 you're safe which is good <laughs> um, because these can be relatively nasty. I'll let you know now what each of them does. The Frost Giant is going to immediately cancel out a guard. The two are going to kill each other, so he will knock off one guard, and he himself will be killed. If there is nobody there when the Frost Giant gets to the camp, he just jumps the wall, and that counts as one breach. There can only be three breaches, and then the game ends. So the game can end instead of somebody getting to ten points. And also, once someone breaches the wall, they work the same way the robber, or in this game, Tormund, does, in that this space will no longer produce when a 5 is rolled until something kills this wildling off of the space. Then a 5 can now produce on that space again. Now, the, oops, the climbers are different from the other two types, in that when they get to the wall, whether there are guards there or not, they just immediately jump the wall. And that does not count as a breach. Once they hear it, they still block that space, though. The regulars, the regular wildlings, they will sit happily at the bottom of the camp here until they outnumber the guards. Once they outnumber the guards, they will kill one while breaching and taking the next available spots. Also counts as a breach. So sometimes that can end up as a combo, for instance, if in this case there were two here, and there's a frost giant here, and a three gets rolled. This frost giant is going to come here, which before there were two wildlings and two guards. They were fine for the moment. They were holding them off. But once the frost giant gets there, they are going to kill one. Now the regular uh, wildlings outnumber the guards, so they breach and in process kill the second guard. And that will trigger a breach. So the game can end on three breaches, or if you have ten points at the end of your turn, and only at the end of your turn, uh, or if eight of the different spaces are taken up by wildlings. Eight or more are taken up by wildlings. Then whoever has the most points is going to be the winner. Some other changes to the game are going to be that the longest road and largest patrols are now only worth one point, whereas in the base game they are worth two points. And also, whenever someone takes either one of these, a wildling token will get flipped and wildlings will come on into play. If there are ever four wildlings on a space and a fifth one 
is brought out, then there will be what's called a wildling rush. And what will happen is the first one is going to advance into the camp to the, the lowered number, and then the next one will move two spaces forward into the camp with a higher number, and then everybody else just advances two spaces to fill in everything else. So that, as you might imagine, can be pretty bad because you're, you're moving forward two of those different, uh, different sets of wildlings, which is just not what you want. Other things that can happen. When you build, when you build a settlement, you see at the beginning of the game, there are going to be settle, uh, wildling tokens set underneath the settlements and the keeps. Whenever you build a settlement, one wildling token will come out. Whenever you upgrade a settlement to a keep, you are going to flip two of these wildling tokens. So lots of lots of wildlings coming out. Other things to be aware of that are different is some of the points that you have. And that's the main difference there is the guards. As you get guards on the wall, not only are they really useful for stopping those breaches which can end the game, also if you end up having let's see for instance, if we had gotten if blue had gotten 3 on the wall, 3 of them is worth 1 point three or four, uh, five or more is going to be worth two points. But if you ever move into a situation where, you know, there's a, you know, these guys come over here and kill one of them, the ice giant kills one of them, frost giant kills one of them, uh, now that's going to move blue, instead of having a point, they will have no points for their uh, guards. So that is going to fluctuate, and that's why you have to have ten points at the end of your turn. One of my favorite things from this expansion, or not expansion, but this version of the game, are these nobles. Everybody's going to get one to start the game, and you will be swapping them out as the game goes on, because every time you use one, you get to choose to either keep it and flip it over, meaning you have one more use before you have to turn it in, or you turn it in immediately after the first use. And when you turn it in, you get to look through all the available ones and choose which one you want, and then you can use that on your next turn, because you can only use a power once per turn. Only one character, only once per turn. Uh, some of the things that they do are pretty cool. Samuel Tarly, for instance, makes it so if you ever roll and you don't get anything, unless it's a seven, because on sevens nobody gets anything, uh, then you get to choose any one resource of your choice. Uh, Bowen Marsh makes it so you can trade once per turn instead of the regular three resources to get one you can turn any one resource in to the market to get one. Uh, if you have a settlement adjacent to one of these, then you can spend that resource two to one to get something else. But once per turn, you get to turn in one one to one. Uh, for instance, Jerry Mormont. Then he allows you to demand that one of the other players, or both of the other players, give you one resource of your choice. So you can say, hey, if you've got a stone, give it to me. And they give it to you, and then you trade them one resource in return. So it's a forced trade of one to one. So that's pretty cool. There's also these minor houses, which are not in the base game, I don't believe. I think they're part of a promo or little mini expansion. They're one-time bonuses that are relatively weak, but it is just a little bit of extra something that could come up and be of interest. Other than that... There's not a whole lot of major differences. Uh, Tormund, for those who don't know Catan, he works like the robber. Whenever a seven is rolled, you the person who rolled the seven is going to move him onto a space. That space will not produce as long as he is there uh, whenever that number is rolled. And then you get to steal a resource from one of the players that has a settlement adjacent to that space. So if I, the red player put this here, this is no longer going to produce, and they can choose to either steal a resource from the blue or yellow player. Other than that, the game functions pretty much the same. There's these developments that you can get that do a lot of fun things, but you can only play one a turn. Sometimes they give you points, so you can't turn out like three of them that are worth a point on one turn and jump from, you know, seven points to ten, and then boom, I win! Surprise! You know, you can surprise win in some cases, but not to, the, not to that extent. Um, other than that, I think that is everything, so let's go ahead and jump up top and I'll let you know what I like other than, I guess I'll let you know real quick, I like the production value, the pieces, has a good table presence, the insert to the game is very well made, and uh, yeah, the pieces all look very nice. 
Alright, so now you should have a pretty good idea of how to play through a Game of Thrones Catan, so I want to let you know what I like about the game. First off, I will admit that I really don't like Catan. <laughs> it's one of my least favorite games, and it's not necessarily that it's my least favorite game, it's just I don't like the game and people bring it up so often that it sort of like creates this over-the-top response to it that the game doesn't necessarily deserve, but that I end up feeling more than I should against the game. The things that I really don't like about the game are when you roll the dice and you just get screwed over and over and over and over again. If the dice aren't your friend and no one wants to trade with you, which happens a lot with me because I have a bit of a reputation for winning in my game groups, and so t people will tend to do things that target me. Namely, it's going to be not trading with me. So then I'm going to be up a creek more than normal. So what I like about this that I think is a massive improvement is that they have these variable player powers that sometimes will give you a way to get get resources regardless or get different ways to upgrade things or cheaper ways to do th all these different variable player powers and that they can shift throughout the game. So the game, the the power that you're given at the beginning of the game isn't necessarily going to be what you are stuck with for the rest of the game. You can go ahead and swap it out for something that's going to be better in the moment. And sometimes you might not want to swap it out because that thing that you're giving away might be one of your favorite powers of the things that works really well with your strategy. But you have a pretty good chance of getting it back too. So I really think that that is a phenomenal addition that fixes a large portion of the game that I don't like. The other part is they added in this different way that you can kind of score points as well as end the game. I think it's really interesting that you have to kind of manage the wall and that you can put people up on the wall and that's another way that you can score points. It's another way that you can work towards end game is how you're kind of managing all that onslaught that's coming out in the north. And also it introduces an element of risk in that if you get the different uh, pieces of land that are up on the northern side, you might get you know, they might have some better numbers for you there, but they also, later in the game, they're probably going to get overrun, and that's going to be something that you have to kind of factor in, because then those dice rolls aren't going to help you anymore. So I think that those, those two things fix a massive amount of what I don't like about Catan. So, things that I don't like about the game is... It's still... Another complaint I guess I have about Catan is that it's too long for what it is. This game... I think it's still a little bit on the long side for what it is. But I will say it is probably one of, if not the only, Catan setup that I think that I will really consent to playing. Um, and it's not because I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones, I actually don't care about Game of Thrones at all. But I think it's a great game to have in the collection for Gateway because a lot of people have heard of Catan, maybe they already know that they like Catan. And there's a lot of people who like Game of Thrones. So I, that's one of the reasons why I keep it, even though it's not something that I'm passionate about. I do like it a lot better than Catan. It, it moves it into the realm of, it, this is a palatable experience for me. I, I can enjoy this. Um, it still maintains some of that, if people don't want to trade with you, they can still kind of direct things a little bit more than I think I like in a game. I don't like... The, you know, the ability to do some king-making or anti-king-making, however you want to call that term. But I don't like games that have that. There's still going to be the element of the dice hating you. So those still remain, but they are mitigated quite a bit. So who I think is going to like this game is going to be, if you like Catan already, I guess that's a, that's a back and forth thing, because if you like Catan already, this might change it up enough to where you're like, this isn't the Catan that I know. I just wanted to be able to do this and have Jon Snow and... Okay, maybe it changes things more than you would like. But I think for most people, it's going to have a different path for you to pursue. And to me, I think it enriches the experience. But if you're maybe a Catan purist, it might change the formula for you. So I guess that's a kind of a, a thing that could be a pro or a con, depending on whether you are passionate about Catan and its original rule set or just about the experience in general. Because I think it maintains the experience in general, but it definitely changes things up. People are also going to like this game if you're a fan of Game of Thrones. I think that's a no-brainer. I think that's probably the only reason, or one of the big reasons why you're watching this video, is because you're already a fan of Game of Thrones, not necessarily a fan of Catan. 
although it could be the latter, I think it's more often going to be the former. So if you like Catan and you like Game of Thrones, it's a no-brainer. Go ahead and do it. Um, if you are like me and you're not a big fan of well, let's see what I get. Roll the dice, and I got nothing. If you don't like games where luck is that big a factor in things, this might still not check that box for you. Kind of like for me, it's a game that I will seldom choose to pull out on a game night because there's so many good games out there. Why would I necessarily want to waste my time on a game that I don't already love? But if someone recommends it, Okay, if I must play Catan, it's going to be this one. Alright, so let's go ahead and take the spotlight off of A Game of Thrones Catan by Klaus and Benjamin Tuber, published by Fantasy Flight Games. If you want to know more about this game, take a look in the description section where you can find a link to my unboxing as well as a more in-depth setup and gameplay sample. And you can also find a link to macronovagames.com where you can buy hundreds of phenomenal games. Please let me know in the comment section below if I missed anything or if you have any feedback for me on the game and uh, pretty much anything in general. If you have recommendations for videos to make or whatever, I'd love to connect with you. Until next time, I want to thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you like what you see, and as always, have a wonderful day.